Steve, you are something of an iconoclast, having been trained as a neuroscientist, a hardcore neurophysiology, and yet have come to the point where you do not believe that consciousness, the mind, call it what you will, can be reduced to simply brain function. The question reminds me of a comment that Arthur Kessler once made, at least I think it was Arthur Kessler, he said, uh, nobody cares if you betray humanity, but you mustn't be disloyal to your club. <laughs> and uh, what you're pointing at is a certain degree of yeah, yeah. disciplinary disloyalty. Uh, well, I, I have to say that my uh, views have been changed by virtue of my experience. I uh, certainly would not have uh, let go of my initial convictions that the study of the underlying brain processes was a royal road to an understanding of mental activity and behavior. Uh, unfortunately, I had several experiences in my professional life where I was led up against a kind of brick wall with that kind of thinking. And uh, I've also been very influenced uh, by a remark that Albert Einstein once made. Einstein said in the aftermath of the Second World War, the aftermath of the bomb and of the Holocaust, uh, he said, by painful experience, we've learned that rational thinking, which is of course the mode of thinking of the scientist, is not sufficient in dealing with the problems of our social life. Mm. And in another related context, he said, we need a new way of thinking. Now, this is a very interesting remark coming particularly from someone like Einstein. He was not arguing that we don't need to think rationally. He was arguing that rational thinking by itself is not sufficient to deal with certain kinds of problems. And that's very much been my experience. It's what's moved me toward the study of affect as well as cognition. And it is what has moved me away from the idea that the, uh, the, there is one and only one true and valid, universally correct way of approaching all problems from a scientific perspective. And that is through the method of analytical atomism, mechanistic reductionism. And so I have been searching for much of the past couple of decades for a way of realizing uh, an alternative way of thinking, which of course amounts to thinking in terms of an alternative paradigm. Once again, not one that rejects rationalism or reject, rejects mechanistic reductionism, but which seeks to complement that approach with another approach that is much more capable of dealing with the realities of complexity and contingency and context dependency, which we see all around us in all sorts of situation. How did your experience with the Love Canal affect your thinking? Well, <clears throat> Love Canal, as perhaps not everybody remembers, uh, was a housing development built near Niagara Falls on an old uh, canal that had been used for a long time by an industrial firm as a dumping ground for industrial chemicals. People there discovered in the 70s that they were living in a community where there was an extraordinarily high incidence of a wide variety of health problems. Uh, and these included problems of a kind that we would call neuropsychological. Uh, and those people manifested a wide range of abnormal physiological conditions and a very wide range of uh, health and mental and behavioral conditions. But there was no way of finding any direct causal link between this particular form of exposure and that particular behavioral manifestation. What you find again, as in many other situations in the study of brain and behavior relationships, a very complex, very contingent, 
very context-dependent set of relationships. No simple linear reduction to the biological level was sufficient to explain the behavioral effects and no combination of the underlying biological phenomena was sufficient to account for the behavioral effects. Mm -hmm. So once again, you see the situation in which the behavioral effects are obviously manifestations of an interaction between things going on within the organism and things going on in the surrounding environment. That would mean that the same uh, intervention, some industrial chemical, could cause one set of behavioral uh, problems in one person, a completely different set and same in, in a different person. Precisely. Because of, because of their different context, their different uh, in personalities, their different emotions, so that same physiological input to wherever it affects it has, has different outputs. Exactly. I'll give you another uh, contemporary relevant example. We all know about Agent Orange and uh, the uh, materials used as defoliants in uh, Vietnam and the complaints of health effects in veterans returning from that war. A number of experiments were performed in laboratories in this country uh, exposing animals to varying levels of these chemicals and finding that for the most part the effects were relatively innocuous. The huge difference, of course, is the question of whether the exposure occurs in a kind of pristine laboratory environment or whether the exposure occurs to a person otherwise undergoing enormous stress mm -hmm. and uh, as a result of the, the climate of warfare. To believe that Agent Orange or any other chemical exerts the same effects on a sedentary organism in a laboratory and on a person uh, who's exposed to the same materials in a highly stressful environment is simply inconsistent with the evidence. Same sorts of things have been done in experiments exposing animals to uh, emissions from automobile engines. Uh, and by and large, you can expose animals to relatively high levels of emissions products, but your exposure and my exposure to these sorts of materials occurs when we're on the highway on a Friday afternoon trying to get somewhere and uh, we're under enormous stress. You have to take into consideration the, again, I'm, I'm like a broken record, okay. the, uh, the context in which the exposure occurs. Exposure by itself is not a sufficient explanation. So what are the implications of your experience, of your work, on your view towards consciousness, mind, from a non-reductionist point of view? Uh, people who insist upon seeing the answers to all large questions in the very small, to seeing the, the answer to questions about mental activity and behavior only in terms of neurological uh, phenomena seem to me to be uh, going in precisely the wrong direction. That what is needed is a way of thinking, to return to what I said earlier, uh, that uh, allows us to integrate both the internal biological and the external environmental and social factors. And furthermore, uh, the way that we talk about mental events needs to be examined very closely. Increasingly, I find the concept and the word mind being used by colleagues in a way that allows them to talk about it as if it is an organ, as if it is a tangible entity. That is an example, in my opinion, of what uh, Whitehead called the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Of course there is mental activity, of course there is behavior, but to think that the mental activity and the behavior is being pr produced by a structure called the mind, and if we could only find and locate it and look inside of it, that we would find the sources of these behaviors, is it seems to me the most naive form of mechanistic reductionism. 